Hey, students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker, and today we're going to start a new chapter, and we're going to talk about centroids and centers of gravity. So let's get into a few definitions here. As we talk about centroids, what we're talking about here with centroids is the center of an area. And a center of gravity could be defined as the center of weight, okay? So we also could have, if you want to, a center of mass, right, which is a center of mass. And the center of mass and the center of gravity are in the same location as long as you have a uniform gravitational field. So usually we just stick with center of gravity because we talk more about weights passing through the center of gravity. So in a two-dimensional object, if it is like, say, a sheet of plywood, and you're looking at just the surface of that sheet of plywood, the centroid and the center of gravity would be in the exact same spot. Okay, So these are closely related terms. We also, of course, could have a center of volume. We could have a center of length. There's a bunch of different things we could find the center of. And it turns out we have the exact same fundamental equations to find all of these. Okay, So let's just give us a small diagram up here to talk about some of our terminology. So we're going to use an xy axis, x horizontal, y vertical. Here is some shape. Let's say that this is a differential area dA. Okay. Now, if you've been in Calculus 3, or you will be in Calculus 3 at some point, you've dealt with these dAs as you found centroids of bodies as related to integrals. So it turns out that I'm going to leave the integrals to calculus. And we're going to focus on a technique here in statics called a method of composite parts. Okay, so if we know the centroid and areas of parts, then we can put those together into a composite system and find the centroid of the overall. So as we talk about centroid, we talk about distances to the middle. Okay, so we'll call this X bar and then a vertical distance here in the y direction, y bar. So these would be our two centroidal distances. Notice that these are both directional vectors, right? They're not arrows on both ends. It's not just the distance. It is actually to the x bars to the right of the y axis, y bars above the x axis. It turns out that both of these, because they're lining up with a positive x and positive y, this would be a positive y bar and a positive x bar. Okay, so that basically defines for us what is x bar, what is y bar, and what is dA. So we can then write some equations. And so we're going to write two different columns of equations. We're going to write some integral equations. Okay, So these are going to be our calculus equations, and then also write ones for our composite parts. All right. And I'm going to focus on the centroid of areas. Okay, So I'm going to use all dA's versus dM's, which would be the, the, a differential mass unit, or dW's, a differential weight unit. Um, so we're going to focus on dA's, which is most of the centroids that you'll do here in statics. And so we have an equation that says that x bar is equal to the integral of all of my x bar of each element, okay, you can think of basically each element being your dA, times that dA, and we're going to divide this by the integral of just dA, okay. Hopefully you recognize if you integrate all of your dA's, what do you have? Well, you have your area, and then the top term here we're basically multiplying a distance times an area. So you can think of this in a couple different ways. One of these is a distance weighted area. Or we kind of call more technically the first moment of area. Right, so we took moments as in like an R cross F. And so you could think of this be kind of fundamentally an R times R area at that location. 
okay so that is this top term the first moment area or the distance weighted area so we can have the basically um, very similar equations in the x the y and the z so we could find that our y bar centroidal distance in the y direction is in the integral form equal to our um, y bar of the element times dA divided by the integral dA and then z bar very similarly integral of z bar of the element times dA divided by an integral of dA Okay, so note that all three of these have the exact same area in the bottom. So if you actually ask to compute all three, use the same area. Don't keep doing more and more work. Now, the version that we're going to use is going to be for discrete composite parts. Okay, so instead of having an integral, we're going to talk about summations. And so our x bar is going to equal the summation adding together all of the products of our x bar of the element times each of the areas. Okay, a sub i. I could also write this technically as like x bar sub i times a sub i, but we like to use this element notation. And in the bottom here, we're going to have the summation of all of our a sub i's. Once again, our total area. Same form for y bar. y bar is equal to the summation, capital sigma, of all of my, excuse me, this is my y bar of each element times the area of that element divided by the sum of all of my areas. And then z bar, if it happens to be a three dimensional problem, equal again the summation of all of your z bar of each element times the area of that element divided by the summation of all of your areas. Okay, so you can see a very parallel structure between the integral form and also the composite parts form. This is going to be our focus in statics, is looking at composite parts. And so you might be wondering, well, where do these composite parts equations come from? They come from a table. So here is the table of centroidal distances and areas. This is the exact same one that is in your textbook. Now, one thing to highlight here right away is we are not going to talk about this last column. This is area moments of inertia. This comes in in chapter 10 of your textbook. So that'll come in later. Okay, we'll get back to that. And But because area moments of inertia and centroids are very closely related, also in their computation, we put all the information into one single table. All right. So as we look at these shapes, first of all, let's take a look. Zooming in here, here's a square. Now, if our axis is based here along the left edge, there's our y axis, and along the bottom, there's our x axis. So we're measuring from that axis to the centroid. All we need to do is measure over base over base over two to get to the x centroidal distance, and then height over two to get the y centroidal distance. And we usually use the letter G for our centroid, and we use that little um, black and white dot for the centroidal location. Okay, so pretty straightforward, area, base times height, and then those centroidal distances. Now, if you're wondering where these centroidal distances come from, you're very welcome to test your integration skills and see if you can back solve for these exact same values doing that first moment divided by the total area will give you those equations. Now, triangles, the centroid, instead of being located at half of the base and half of the height, turns out it's be one third of the base and one third of the height. It turns out also that there is a third third axis, which is basically looking at off of this face over here. And so if we found the total distance from O um, to that face in a perpendicular distance, we would actually find that there's a third, ac the third distance um, from here to here, which is going to be one third of that total height. Okay, So triangles are all about a thirds, the centroid being basically a third from any of the straight faces, right? Any of the faces, one third of the distance. So in a right triangle, one third of the height, one third of the base. Circles, of course, no surprise there. Another symmetrical object, um, distance to the centroid is just whatever distance it is to the center of that circle. 
Um, as we get into a half circle, um, the x centroidal distance is pretty straightforward. That's just the radius. And now we're getting a little bit more complicated equations as we look at the vertical distance here. So the vertical distance being 4r over 3 pi. I've gone ahead and given you new, the decimal equivalent. One thing I see students always forgetting to do is put this 3 pi in parentheses when they put in their calculator and they get a, an errant value. So you're welcome to use the 0.4244. And it turns out for a quarter circle, the last shape here on the diagram, we have the exact same value for x bar and y bar, which is still that 4r over 3 pi. Once again, if you're going to put it in as exact value, don't forget your parentheses around 3 pi. Okay, so that gives you the distance to each one of those shapes. Now, you might be wondering, like, well, how do we use this then, right? If these are these distances and we have composite parts, what does that look like? And so to give you a quick um, evaluation of that idea. Let's take a look if we have, so here's our x and y axis system. Let's say that we have uh, a square. Okay, so I'm going to put this square here. Okay, so here's the centroid, call this G1, the centroid of that square. And let's say I weld to that square a right triangle. Okay. And its centroid is going to be one third of the distance from any of the straight faces. So kind of one third, one third, one third, somewhere about here, G2. All right. So as we look at the centroidal distances for each one of these, we can see here that our X bar, we're going to call this element one. We're going to call this element two. Okay. So X bar sub one, because now there's two of them is going to be the horizontal distance there, while x bar sub 2, excuse me, this is not x bar sub 2, this is y bar sub 1, from my x-axis up to that point is going to be that. So our x bar and y bar are not always just going to be for a square, base over 2 and height over 2. In this case, we basically have to add, let's call this distance here, um, uh, I'll just call it 1.5. Okay, so I've got a horizontal distance here of 1.5, and let's say I have a vertical distance from here to here of 1. Okay, so I could write that my x bar sub 1 is equal to the distance of 1.5 plus the distance over the centroid, which is going to be the base over 2. Okay, so only one part of this came from the centroidal table, and that is the base over 2, but we have to get over to the axes as given in the centroidal table. By the same token, we could write that y bar sub 1, uh, the distance to the element of shape 1, is going to be a value of 1 plus height over 2. Okay, we do need to pay attention to positives and negative values. Another thing to note here is if we wanted to find, say, the distance, horizontal distance over to G2, right, this would be X bar sub 2. Now, let's say in this problem that we have a total horizontal distance to this side over here, right? Remember that we're always measuring our triangle centroids from the faces. So let's say this distance from here over here is 6. So the way that I would find this x2 value, x2, is I'm actually going to add in the 6 first and then subtract off the base over 3, right, to come back to the centroid, right? So it's basically coming over here 6, coming back in this direction, base of the triangle divided by 3, this term here. Okay, so all centroidal distances have signs. Line them up with your axis system. Basically add things together, subtract off. Uh, in this case, the y bar 2 is going to be either on or very close to 0, right, because measuring off the x axis. Um, but that kind of gives you an idea of how we can come up with these x bar and y bar of the elements is adding together both the distance from the corner of the shape plus any additional distance um, to that shape from the axis system. So let's go ahead and apply this concept to an example problem. Okay, so using composite parts to find the centroid of this area. So the area is basically outlined by a dark line. Now you'll notice here that we have a couple of negative areas. Okay, so this is a cutout here um, that is two inches by four inches. I need to add that dimension there. We're talking here. This is now notice that each one of these grid cells is an inch. Okay. So you can pull dimensions off here as well. So I have a cutout there. I also have another cutout here that has a three inch radius. 
Okay, so the rest of the body is a positive shape, and then those two are cutouts since we think of them as negative shapes. So one of the first things you want to do is think about how you're going to divide this into parts. It's easiest if you can minimize your number of parts. Okay, it makes just like less computations overall. So what I've chosen to do is actually divide up a triangle from a square, and I'll sketch this all out here. So let me just show. So I have an overall rectangle here that has a total distance here. 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 is 12. So there it's 12. And the total height 4 plus 4 plus 2 is 10. And then I have a positive triangle here. has a base of 6 and a height here to here of 10. And then I have a cutout shape. I'll put this in red just so we really highlight. Hey, this is a cutout. This is a negative shape. And it's 2 by 4. Okay, so 2 by 4. And this is a negative cutout shape. And then I have one more cutout shape, which is that half circle. And so here is my half circle with a three inch radius. Okay, so there are my four shapes. I have decided to number these. Um, we'll go with the positive ones first. And so here's one. Here, the right triangle is two. We're going to go with the half circle as three. And then the rectangle is four. Okay, and the reason I'm going to number these, I'm actually going to put them into an organized table that I can kind of work through line by line and figure out what are the various distances to the centroid, what are the areas, and then I'll show you how we can very easily compute then our overall centroid from our given axes, right? Noting that our given axis is centered here at point O. Okay, so you do need to use the axes as given in the problem. Okay, so anything above that axis will be a positive y bar. Anything to the right of it will be a positive x bar. Below the x axis, a negative y bar, right? So all of our different centroidal distances. All right, so here's what a common table looks like. Um, we have one column for the number of our body. Our next column is our area. Now one thing I like to do is put my units up in the header so I don't have to put them in the table itself. And then we have our X bar of each element. That will be a distance in inches. Then I have my Y bar of each element and that will also be in inches. And then I have my x bar of each element times each area, right, each a, let me just put this in here, a sub i, and then we'll have the y bar of each element times a sub i. Okay, so each of these becomes a column, something like this. Okay, so for my rectangle, shape number one, I have a width of 12, a height of 10, so 120 inches squared. Now the distance here to the centroid, we can actually plot that point on here if we want to. Okay, so the centroid here is going to be six over, so two, four, and six, so somewhere along this line, and then five up from the bottom, so two, four, five, okay. So here's my centroidal point, I call this G sub one. Right, that's the centroid of the rectangle. So I want to find a horizontal distance to that point and then also the distance off of the x-axis for um, y bar EL. And so I have a distance horizontally positive 6. And then I have a minus 1, right? Because it's 1 inch below the x-axis. So this is the coordinate of the centroid of that body. Now realize that these last two columns over here are simply the product of things going on in the first three columns, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and actually write all of these terms here first, kind of all my geometric terms, and then I'm just gonna go through and basically do the multiplying. And I'll talk through kind of a, uh, a computational thing that can help you out in, in working through that on your calculator. Okay, so that's for shape one. Shape two is the right triangle. Of course, the right triangle is going to be the base, which is six times the height, which is 10. I'm going to put the values in here. And we're going to take that times one half, one half base times height. This is equal to 30. Now, as you work on these centroidal tables, you need to show some level of work, okay? Not just numbers. But fundamentally, if you're doing anything more than, say, multiplying a base times a height, and even up here, I probably should have written 10 times 12 is equal to 120, right? 
like leave a leave a, a track of where these numbers came from. Now your x bar E L is the distance over to the centroid of the right triangle. Okay, the right triangle doesn't start for the first 12 inches of this space, and then the right triangle starts. Okay, so we could write this distance as 12 plus the base is 6 divided by 3. This ends up being 14 inches to the right of our y axis. Okay, once again, the full distance over to the centroid of that element. Now, as we do the same thing here for the centroid of the vertical centroid, so here often I'll write this as minus 6. That brings me down here to the bottom of the triangle and then counting back up from there. So then I have minus 6 and we're going to have plus the total height is 10 divided by 3. And so this ends up equaling, it's 8 thirds, but it's a minus 8 thirds. Okay, because the centroid is still below the y, the x-axis. Okay, so this is just noting that um, the distance to the centroid from that x-axis is negative for both these terms, and that works out completely fine for us. Now we're on to the half circle. The area of a half circle is pi r squared divided by 2. So pi 3 squared divided by 2. This is for shape number 3. But this is a cutout. Okay, so we need to have a negative sign out front. Negative spaces have negative areas. And so this is equal to negative 14.14. The distance to its centroid from the y-axis, so in the x distance, is going to be a value of 6, right? 3 plus 3 is equal to 6. And then the y-centroid is going to be minus 6 plus the 4 times r, which is 3, divided by 2 times pi, sorry, not 2 times pi, but 3 times pi, 4r over 3 pi. This is equal to negative 4.727. And then for our last row, shape number 4, the rectangle. So this is going to be negative base times height, which is equal to 2 times 4, negative 8. My x distance it sits over there actually on kind of halfway um, onto the right triangle, halfway onto the rectangle. So it's a distance of 12 horizontally. Okay, so 12 over to its centroid. And looking at our axis system, it's a four total in height. So half of its height down from the x-axis is going to be a minus two. All right, now like I said, all we have to do is multiply. Okay, so I look here and I have 120 times six. And 120 times 6 gives me 720. Now, I commonly will do an entire row because in my calculator, then all those terms will be adjacent to each other because we're going to need to do some summations, right? Looking back to your equations, we had summations of areas. We also had summations of these first moments of area. Okay, so just going down through these. Now, notice here we have 14 times 30. That's going to be positive, so that's going to be 420. Next, we have a negative area times a positive x bar and gives me negative 84.84, followed by negative area again, negative 8 times 12, negative 96. So when I sum those together, like I said, if you do them in order like that, you'd find a summation of positive 958.8. You can actually get a negative first moment of area, and it would tell you if you had a negative first moment of area that your x bar is going to be negative. Okay, But don't throw out that negative if you do get a negative sum. Over in my y bar of the element times my areas, now I'm multiplying uh, 120 times negative 1, right? negative 120. 30 times negative 8 thirds gives me negative 80. Um, negative 14.4 times negative 4.727 gives me a positive 66.84. And then negative 8 times negative 2 is a positive 16. Adding those together, a negative 117.16. Okay, and then the summation of our areas, 120 plus 30 minus 114.4. 14 minus 8 gives me 127.9. Okay, so that fills out all of my table. One step left to go ahead and compute that x bar is equal to 
the sum of my x bar elements times a i divided by the sum of my areas. So the values here 958.8 divided by a positive 127.9 gives me a positive value of 7.5 inches. And then we can do the same thing for y bar. So y bar is equal to the summation of my y bar elements times a sub i, my far right hand column, same area here, sum of my areas. And so negative 117.16 divided by 127.9 gives you a negative value, negative 0 0.92 inches. Now because centroids, have an intuitive feel to them. I think it's always worth plotting your answers on your diagram and maybe even trying to plot your guess on your diagram before you even get started, right? Just kind of get a feel for where these might sit. And so 7.5 inches over, we said it was six here to G1, so another one and a half brings us over here. And then minus almost one brings us to right here. Okay, so that would be my overall centroid G of that shape. And you could think that if you put your finger right underneath there, right, that would be the balance point of that shape. And so it makes sense that that would be its overall centroid. So that's how we use composite parts. We first divided the overall com the complicated composite part body into simpler shapes, ones that we have on our equation sheet. We then set up a table, and in this table we add areas and distances, noting that there's kind of there's three geometric columns over here on this side and then two arithmetic columns right we're just multiplying the terms over here from our geometric columns we then collected the information we needed to compute our x bar and y bar as the summation of these various columns now if you end up with a problem say it's the center of weight or say it's the center of weight of a three-dimensional object all you really do in those problems is start adding more columns Okay, so a 3D, so kind of the most complicated I can think of is a 3D object with multiple parts. Is we have a number of bodies, we next would have the volume of each body. Maybe then we have a specific gravity, which often is indicated with gamma. And this is like a force or a weight per volume. Right, so like newtons per meter cubed would be your specific weight. Then you could find your total weight, right, of each shape. Then you could find still your x bar of each element, your y bar of each element, and your z bar of each element. Then you would multiply these three distances times your weight, right? So you'd have your um, X bar EL times W, your Y bar times EL times W, just like we did with the areas, and then your Z bar times EL times W. And then you would end up summing your weights, summing your first moments in these three axes directions, and basically do the same thing we did above. Okay, so like I said, it adds more columns. So let me just put some lines here to show all these different columns. But the process is, like I said, it's, it's, it's the same general process. We just are focused on weights versus areas. And so this would be to find the center of gravity versus the center of area. All right, well, that's it for centroids. Um, like I said, there's a lot of intuitive feel to this. You're getting some exposure in calculus as well. So just introducing you to this idea of composite parts. I hope you're having a great day.